Fox News podcast presents Brett Baer's All-Star Panel. America's got to be in the lead if you want to deal with these threats. We're going to lead. The morning is over. The shiva is done. And if you're a conservative, you should be optimistic. You know, my main priority right now is making sure that it delivers for the American people. We have to make our country great again, and I will do that. I think the president gets criticized by people all the time for the stuff he says, by people who ignore what he does. Now, Fox's chief political anchor, Brett Baer. As the seismic decision by the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade continues to send ripples through the country, politically, demonstrations in major cities from both sides of the argument, the potential effects will be decided during the midterm elections and how states will individually handle the ruling. Plus, another landmark decision on prayer in schools handed down. We're still awaiting the release of major decisions on immigration and EPA regulations before the end of the current term. Meantime, on Capitol Hill, the January 6th committee hearings about the Capitol riot on January 6th continued with a blockbuster witness. When hearing Rudy's take on January 6th and then Mark's response, that was the first, that evening was the first moment that I remember feeling scared and nervous for what could happen on January 6th. And I had a deeper concern for what was happening with the planning aspects of it. For more on this, we bring in our panel. NPR national political correspondent, Mara Lyason, Fox News radio political analyst, Josh Kraschauer, and Republican strategist, former campaign manager for Senator Scott Brown, Colin Reed. Josh, let me start with you. This January 6th committee, you know, it was not scheduled. It was uh, Cassidy Hutchinson, who was a top aide to Mark Meadows, the White House chief of staff, who had access to a lot of people. And those conversations, apparently she's a really good note taker, uh, under oath, testified to some pretty amazing things behind the scenes leading up to January 6th and on that day. Yeah, she is definitely the most compelling witness that we've seen so far namely because she was she was in the room she was feet away from the president in the oval office and she was with him uh in the moments before and during the the january 6th rally and boy did we learn a whole lot about the details of of what happened during the rally and that the the president had no qualms with having an armed mob you know go forth upon the Capitol. He he actually didn't want a magnometer test and and a security check for all the folks who were coming in with weapons um, on that that very, very, on that very epic day. And that, you know, that's a a powerful piece of evidence that there was, you know, he knew that this wasn't just organic. This was something that he he wanted to kind of foment um, on on January 6th. We also learned that there was this epic confrontation in the in the presidential car, in the in, in the beast, where uh, he you know grabbed the clavicle of his Secret Service agent um, and demanded that he they go to the Capitol, uh, that he actually go they drive him to the Capitol, and that did not happen. Uh, that, that this was secondhand ev- evidence, is something she heard, uh, but, but but it sounded fairly detailed, fairly compelling, and it showed how determined the president was really to just aggravate the situation, aggravate the mob. On January, on January 6th. 6th. And then, Mara, and just to circle back to that uh, in the Beast story, uh, she retells it after hearing it in front of uh, Pat Cipollone, the White House counsel, and the actual agent. And uh, so that's her, her secondhand knowledge of that. But what, what's compelling, perhaps mostly, is that she had this direct knowledge of conversations. And beforehand, where Mark Meadows says, we could be in for a very, very bad day on January 6th. And that she hears the group's Oath Keepers and Proud Boys mentioned in the days leading up to January 6th in conversations. And is there with the president in the backstage on the ellipse when he says, I don't effing care about the magnometers, magnetometers. I, they're not here to hurt me. Let them in. I want to fill the, the area. Right. Not only let them in, no magnetometers, but that she testified that he was told by the Secret Service that there were weapons in the crowd that and the committee even played police tapes where they identified certain people with an AR-15 or with a Glock style pistol. But were those people arrested? Do we know? We don't know that. 
we don't know that it was it, this was extraordinary testimony and um you know i mean this sounds kind of cynical my first thought was this was a good day for ron DeSantis. i mean <laughs> but uh it was from very a political point of view that's right yeah 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 but um you know the president was really angry she told she had a lot of cinematic detail throwing his lunch against the wall um and then of course the scene you just described in the beast where he first tried to grab the steering wheel and then literally assaulted a secret service agent and didn't seem to care about the threats to hang Mike Pence, uh, certainly didn't seem to care, knew, but didn't seem to care that his uh, supporters in the crowd were armed. Colin, we also always have the caveat about these hearings in particular, that they're you know, all singing from the same sheet of music. It's very choreographed. Um, there is not a minority voice or there is not another questioner that's pushing from another side. There's not a Congressman Jim Jordan that's cross-examining. But in this case, um, just that testimony alone is pretty earth shattering. I think one of the challenges this committee had from the start, Brett, and it's something that they've at least to date managed to avoid, is having this become all about partisan politics, or at least give off the present the, the appearance that it's all about partisan politics. And I think one of the reasons this committee has so far uh, been successful is they've managed to keep their members out of the way, including some very partisan folks like Adam Schiff, uh, who are, you know is better known for uh, his his uh, his performance during some of the the Russia hearings that that cost him a bit of credibility with with a lot of folks and especially with Republicans. And they've just managed to kind of keep let let the focus be on the witnesses and and their testimony and let it stand. And if you're going to call a surprise hearing at the last minute in the middle of summer and the week before the Fourth of July, you better have someone who brought the goods and so far at this stage it appears as though she did and you know you've seen this brett you've seen uh the former president and, and get crossways with kevin mccarthy about uh not having uh, representatives on the committee and uh that's the decision they made and it's one that they're gonna have to have to live with uh but the other part and to to, to bounce off of uh, lamar's point here you know there there is i'm beginning to believe a, a sense that the republican party has so many opportunities in 2022 and 20, 2024 if they can leave the past in the past uh, and, and, and move on and turn the page. Uh, and the, the, some of this stuff that's happening with this committee uh, might be helping them do that. And I know there was a poll in New Hampshire last week that showed uh, Governor DeSantis tied uh, with former President Trump in that first in the nation primary state. So uh, whether that's a, a byproduct of this committee or time passing or just the absolute disastrous performance of the Biden administration or some combination thereof, we'll find out. Uh, but there, there are opportunities abound for Republicans as long as they can move past and not get stuck in the past. Yeah, and it'll, we'll see the political fallout and and how how it does or does not move the needle. I think just listening to every moment of of today's testimony, it it did seem to be fairly significant in in the storytelling of that day and the days leading up to it. From a person who was in the room, to your point, Josh. All right, let's go to the Supreme Court decision and the impact of Roe v. Wade. We're a few days removed from it. We are in June. We've got a long way to go to November. Josh, does this significance wash out as the battle shifts to the states, or does it become as compelling in some of these independent and purple districts? Well, Brett, the challenge for pro-choice abortion rights uh, supporters is to keep the conversation going all the way till November. And especially in a political environment where, as Colin was alluding to, the economy, inflation is just such a dominant issue. People are feeling uh, disillusioned just about the, their, the, the economy and the state of their own personal finances. That, that is gonna be more resonant. The key is that for the Democrats and for pro-choice advocates is to make sure this is a relevant and resonant issue across the political landscape. I, you know, I've been paying attention to some of the political ads across the country and you're seeing the abortion issue, abortion rights, Roe v. Wade come up in bluer states. You're not seeing it yet come up in purple and, and, and redder states. And I, and I really think that, you know, you're gonna see a few governor's races, especially in the Midwest, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, those races where you have Republicans who have taken pretty hardline stances on abortion, the state of play legally in those states could change dramatically depending on who gets elected. That The decision may benefit Democrats in those individual states. I think broadly speaking, it's just hard to put abortion rights at the top of the, the agenda for most voters when we're facing so many other challenges as a country.